Hey. Hey everyone. Ready to go now? So um here we go. Um I am um just gonna talk to you today. First to explain who I am. My name is James Payne, if you don't know me already, and I am for the from the YouTube channel Great Art Explained. And I'm here today to show you Google Arts and Culture's uh, Super Zoom feature, which is amazing. And, um, and we can also learn a lot about one of my favorite artists and actually one of my favorite works of art as well. So we're going to talk about uh, Bruegel, so Peter Bruegel. And it's a uh, particular painting. We don't, don't need to have any suspense anymore. It's, um, it's a painting on the Netherlandish Proverbs. And uh, I really like Bruegel's work because he's part of the Northern Renaissance group of artists. And they really focused on the everyday artist. Uh, he focused on the peasant, actually. Um, whereas the Italian Renaissance, they focused on the very grand paintings, all the paintings we know very well. The, uh, the paintings, uh, the religious paintings, the mythological paintings, the heroes and the saints. Whereas Bruegel is really focusing on the normal, everyday person. So as modern viewers, we can easily connect to Bruegel and we can e easily see real people we see every every day rather than saints and kings um, before we start though I just want to be real about this is that the paintings you're gonna see are, are of ordinary people but that doesn't mean they actually ever got to see these paintings they were collected by the very very wealthy but for us as modern-day viewers it's very very interesting Bruegel by the way did religious works but the key is here that he really focused on the collective aspects of humanity rather than the individual aspects and something we don't think about when we think about a 500 year old painting is that it can be very funny as well so he's actually very humorous um, first of all to talk about google arts and culture it's an app and it's a website and you can find a collection of 2000 cultural institutions around the world it's pretty amazing and i've used it a lot last time i used it was for my klimt my Gustav Klimt the Kiss video, which is on my channel, Great Art Explained. And um, I use this because you can really focus, focus down, get down in depth. And you can even see the brush strokes that Van Gogh did and the brush strokes that Bruegel did. It goes that close. So I really recommend having a look at that and subscribing to that. But today we're going to look at a painting by um, Peter Bruegel the Elder. What's the difference? Um, is the painting going to come up here? Let me check the Yep. Ah, here you go. Peter Bruegel the Elder. This is his self-portrait. This is this self-portrait is from around 1565. And he's gonna die quite early. He's gonna die in 16 uh, 1569. So he's gonna die in 1569, about four years later. He's gonna die about the age of 40, which is not bad. Not bad actually for that period of history. Um so let's look at the painting itself, the real painting itself. And these paintings are for entertainment uh, let's have a look at the main painting of the Bruegel um, the the bigger painting please perfect so these paintings like this are for entertainment I think the best way of looking at this let's say it's not an art historical way is it's like a cinematic experience this painting is like an action-packed film and we're going to use uh, Google Zoom to go right into the detail, exactly as someone would have done in the 16th century. They're not looking at this in a museum from afar. These are getting in real close and looking at all the tiny, tiny details. I spend a lot of time making films on my own. I'm looking, I've got the, uh, the chat room up at the moment as well. So I'd really like some interaction with you. So I'm going to be asking you questions. I would love if you could type in an answer and let me know what you've got to think. So we're going to start this Super Zoom in a different way from normal ones. So we're, we're showing you the painting right from the beginning. And, that, and it's what makes this painting interesting is his use of proverbs. Now, today, when we think of a proverb, we think of them as funny, kind of irrelevant little things, and we barely take notice of them. But in Bruegel's day, they were important, and they were seen as universal truths. If you think about it, the Bible is full of proverbs. Jesus, of course, quoted proverbs a lot. This is a, a painting about very important stories. It has so many proverbs in this painting. I'm looking up at your text now. Someone have a guess how many proverbs it's got in it. Someone take a rough guess. I'm watching. Anyone want to have a guess? A hundred. That's a very good guess. Uh, so it's not far off, actually. There's 120 proverbs in one painting. So uh, that's why we're going to use the Super Zoom tool to guess uh, which proverbs allude to the piece. 
So if you've watched my channel, you are, uh, yeah, Fleet Fox has used this as an album cover. I know, yeah, I've had that comment quite a lot. Um, so if you've watched my channel, you know how important context is in understanding the work. Um, anyone want to take a rough guess, a very rough guess, at what is the rough date of this painting? Anyone want to go for a rough date? I'm looking, some of you are still guessing the Proverbs. I'm getting some strange answers. 35 there, 36. Okay, I'm going to tell you, ah, here's some uh, guess of the dates. I'm going to tell you what the date is. It's 1559, and it's oil on oak. Um, a lot of these uh, paintings, look at this painting at the moment. A lot of these paintings show uh, the world upside down. And does anyone want to have a guess? That's a great guess, Susan, by the way. Anyone want to have a great guess at... Um, what caused all the problems in this period in the 16th century? What about you, Adrian? I'm sure you know what caused all the problems in the 16th century. Let's have a look at your answers here. Poverty, that's a brilliant, brilliant uh, answer. I think the, uh, you'll all guess this later on, I think, or you're starting to guess it now. But the really biggest problem, of course, in this period in the 16th century was religion. So religion was a major problem in this period. You've got just before this painting, you've got the Counter-Reformation started about 14 years before this painting. You've got the start of the religious plague is a good answer. Start of the religious wars around the corner. And so... Um, You've got the Counter-Reformation, you've got the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, religious wars just about to start. And it's no wonder that Bruegel and painters like him were painting the world upside down, because it was a, a period in history that when it was upside down. So this would be known as a genre painting with scenes of ordinary painting. So genre, spelled G-E-N-R-E. -E. And here we're going to show you another genre painting of uh, Bruegel. So let's have a look at the other painting. And this is a wonderful painting. This is the peasant wedding from about, uh, this is from 1566. Now, who is collecting these paintings? Apart from the religious uh, turmoil, we've also got the growth of the new middle classes. And this is the rise of the merchant class, which I talk about in my film on the Arnolfini portrait. Um, now they could afford to buy expensive art. They couldn't afford this kind of art before. And so we're starting to get more niche subjects in. There's a whole new genre of art. And uh, this is becoming increasingly popular. And the Renaissance um, had already happened when he paints this. So like most painters of this period, they go, he goes to Italy. But funny enough, with Bruegel, it doesn't influence him at all. In fact, when he goes to Italy, all he does is paint mountains. So Bruegel was uh, known as peasant Bruegel because his love of painting the everyday peasant life. And uh, we have to remember as well, just keep remembering, this is a time in history when everyone is painting biblical pictures. Whereas here we've got the regular man. You can check now and again, look at these paintings, look at this character here, and you can see these blank features that Bruegel used. He used these blank features quite a lot. And uh, this image is gonna come up now, a nice little close-up image. This guy here, look, it's absolutely fantastic detail. He's got this blank look on his um, expression. And, um, and this is a way of portraying fools, portraying idiots, because he's doing something idiotic, which I'm going to show you about in a second. We're going to start talking about the proverbs. Um, Bruegel, by the way, was heavily influenced by Hieronymus Bosch, who I also made a video about. And let's have a look at a painting by Bosch. So you get a rough idea of the uh, type of... of, of the um, of the type of paintings that Hieronymus Bosch was doing. We're going to have a look at a painting by Hieronymus Bosch. There you go. So look at the detail. It's hundreds and hundreds of images, hundreds of people. This is the temptation of Saint Anthony. And uh, Bosch was earlier than Bruegel, but Bruegel was very, very heavily influenced by him. And Bosch used humor. Bosch used humor a lot, as you know, if you see my video, to criticize society. But Bruegel was less critical, and there was a real love for the peasant, for the ordinary man. And both of them, both of them, were influenced by drolleries, which I'm going to talk about later. So we're going to go back to Bruegel, we're going to go back and look at the painting, and we're going to start to zoom in on some of the uh, characters. So let's go back to the original painting, first of all. And if you go re right in close to the lady putting the blue cloak on the man there, 
So you see this lady here putting a blue cloak on the man. This is the name of the painting originally. Now it's called Netherlandish Proverbs. Originally it was called the Blue Cloak or the Folly of the World. And Blue Cloak comes from this image, which is illustrating a proverb. Now we're starting to get to some of the proverbs and you'll see um, how some of them don't make any sense whatsoever and some of them are still in use. Um, so this one is, she puts the blue cloak on her husband. That's the proverb. She puts the blue cloak on her husband. If we translate that to a modern proverb, then we could say she is pulling the wall over his eyes or deceiving him. And this image is probably referencing adultery. So this is a kind of a funny image just to um, just to show you um, how Bruegel was working here. So we're going to um, have a look at some more proverbs now. Uh, the theme here is kind of pets, so we're going to go and look at some uh, pets. Don't forget the concept of pets in the Middle Ages was very different. Uh, look at these two dogs here, just fantastic detail. Um, domestic animals like cats and dogs, they existed. Of course they existed. Um, you see them a lot in paintings from the Middle Ages. But dogs were really for protection or for hunting. And cats were really kept for uh, killing rats and mice, really. And this is one of the many proverbs that involves animals. Look how close that detail is. It's just spectacular. You can see the crack allure. You can, see the you can even see the brush strokes on that bone that they're, they're fighting for. So this proverb involves animals, as many of them do. And the original Dutch proverb was two dogs. Uh, I'm going to tell you how, it, how it's um, said. Two dogs over one bone seldom agree. And that would have meant to argue over a single point or to disagree about the same thing. Many, many of these uh, proverbs don't make any sense anymore. We don't use them either in English or in the Netherlands. Um, but let's start with some of the obvious ones. So if you go down to the lamb, and you see the lamb here, we see the lamb again and again in art. And uh, this is one that we still do use, which is to be, you can see it's very quiet, it's very peaceful. I mean, it's tied up, it's going to be quiet. But uh, you can see it's uh, quiet, and it means to be as gentle as a lamb. So that's one that we still use to this day. Um, so being in the Middle Ages, religion, look at the detail, look at that beautiful detail on the hoofs, and uh, it's just spectacular. So uh, let's talk about religion for a little bit because it's so important to this period of history. And in the middle of the 16th century, we're in a period of political religious turmoil. And it's why, as I said, Bruegel painted these upside down or some people call them topsy-turvy worlds. We believe that Bruegel was a Catholic. Um, he had many humanist friends, we believe. And we're talking about Antwerp at the time where he's, uh, where he's based um, in the Low Countries. And this is... Um, uh, there were lots of religious hypocrites around because people were Protestants, they were Catholics, they were changing their mind. And uh, and that's why we're going to show you another proverb. If we go to the one right in the center, which is, of course, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is here in the, in, in the center. I'm going to let you just look at that for a little bit so you can obviously see it's Jesus Christ. Um, but what is the guy doing there? And you see what the guy is doing there. What's he doing to Jesus Christ? I mean, for a start, he's touching him. You don't get that in art very often. Look at the details, how close up that is. So you can see the only holy man in the image is uh, the man with the halo for obvious reasons. And this is Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what the, uh, the, the proverb is. The proverb is to tie a flaxen beard on Christ. And that's what the man is doing, putting a fake beard on Christ. And that translates as using religion to cover up deceit. Yes, someone just said it looks like a Santa Claus beard, which it does. Um, so he, the, someone using religion to cover up lies. And that is why he's putting a fake beard on Jesus Christ. Let's go back to um, animals again. And we're going to look at some more animals in this one. There's, there's so many beautiful details. Um, if we could go into the fish. There you go, right in the center there, the fish. And that's a big fish, like more like a shark, I guess. And he's eating a little fish. And that is what the expression is. It's uh, sharks eat smaller fish. And um, so sharks eat smaller fish. And can anyone guess why this would be a proverb? Why is a big fish eating a small fish? There's a slight delay with my text here, but try and have a guess at why, what that one means. Let me tell you how you'd use it. Let's say in modern days you want to use that expression. You could say, oh, I've had a really bad day. My car won't start. 
well, sharks eat smaller fish. That's how someone would have responded. Oh, this one is still relevant where someone lives here. Okay, now this is something we could use in our everyday life. When someone says to you, uh, you have one similar Italian, perfect. So when someone says to you, um, oh, I, I couldn't get milk in my coffee, you can say to them, well, sharks eat smaller fish. And that's tough, put things in perspective. So that's what that one means. To put things in perspective is there's a big shark eating a small shark. And that's what that one means. Let's go to a couple of impossible to guess one. Survival of the fittest. That's a great, that's a great one. There are so many of them that can be tra translated into very many other ways. I want to show you a couple more obscure ones. And actually my favorite one in the whole painting. So if we could go to the, there you go, the candle with the devil there. Look at that. It's just beautiful. Just, yeah. You see the man in the red cap? He's holding up a, he's holding up a candle. And the devil is kind of, look, go back to the devil. Look at his face. It's so scary. It's very Boschian. Uh, no, not that one. Back to the other one. Back to the other one. There you go. Yeah, that one there. So he's holding a candle to that little devil who's hiding away in the corner. And uh, he's holding a light up to the devil. And what he's doing is he is helping the devil see. And this would, um, how would you use this in modern day? I've no idea. It would be uh, flattering somebody unnecessarily. That's how you translate it into English these days. It's just a beautiful, stunning image. You can actually see the grain of the wood there on the devil's shoulder. Um, and then we, if we can go to my favorite one, which is just below that. This one is just beautiful. And this is the guy you, we saw earlier on, the kind of dumb guy. Uh, he's the fool, the idiot, I guess you're doing. That's because he's doing something idiotic. He's holding a basket. Can anyone see what's in that basket? What's in the basket? Have some answers here. What is he holding in that basket? He's actually holding sunlight. So he's actually holding sunlight. So pull back a little bit there and we can see what a beautiful image that is. So he's holding in his basket, he's holding the sun and uh, or holding sunshine. And the expression is carrying out the day. Hot water is a great guess because it does look like steam, but in fact, it's light. So Yevon, you got it right. It's a uh, light. And so he's uh, carrying out the day is the expression. And that translates as wasting your time because he's doing something impossible. It's just a beautiful image on its own. That's a great painting on its own. Now we're going to um, go to one area just because I want to show you how tightly packed these proverbs are. And we're going to go to an area up in the top right hand corner, please. So you can see everywhere you go. By the way, folks, there's not one single image in this entire painting. Yep, on the boat, please, on the boat. Not one single image in this entire painting that doesn't mean something. And some of them actually mean three or four proverbs, the same image. So this one is, um, you know, they're, they're like blockbuster movies. They're like Tom Cruise movies full of action. Um, so this man is um, a little boat, the man steering. And have a look at where he's looking. Go, let's go straight into his face or her face. I've just realized it's probably, it's, uh, it's probably a guy. So he's looking up, follow his eyes up to the sail. Pull back a little bit. And then look right into the sail, the eye. Look at that. The zoom is unbelievable. And you can see, you know, Bosch has, uh, sorry, um, uh, Bruegel has painted this with a single hair brush. It's just this, he would have used a single hair brush to paint so tiny, tiny details. And uh, so he's looking at the eye and, uh, and, and what that means is to stay alert. So he's looking at the eye and that, all that means is stay alert. Now move very, very slightly over to the left. Look where he's going towards, and that's a church. And you see that there's an expression, an old Netherlandish expression, which is the journey is not over when one can, until one can see the church and steeple. So in other words, uh, that's another one. Don't give up. Don't give up until the job is done. Keep in the same area because I want to show them how. Look at the. You can see the brushstrokes. Look at those brushstrokes. Um, and then keep in the same area. Go up to the sun, please. 
even the sun has got a meaning. And by the way, the sun has got lots of meanings in art. And, uh, and the sun here was, comes from a Dutch expression. And uh, that means, um, it, it, it actually, uh, the expression is, however finely spun, finally comes to the sun. And that would translate as nothing can be hidden forever. Now, the next one I would like to get you to guess. That's in the same area again. And that's those three men there. Let's get some guesses. You've got to get this one. This is easy. This is so easy. There's three men. They've each got their arm on someone's shoulder. None of them are looking up. They're all looking down, which suggests that they can't see. Anyone want to take a rough guess at what that means? I think this is one of the most obvious ones. Three men. The second one is being led by the first one. Third one is being led by the second one. Ah, oh, someone's got it. It's the blind leading the blind. Thank you very much, Greg. It's the blind leading the blind. Yep, and another one. Everyone's getting it now. So it's the blind leading the blind. And uh, that's one that we use to this day, at least in England as well, at least in uh, Britain as well. Now let's go and do, go to some naughty, naughty um, uh, images. The same image, let's have a look at the guy by the gallows. I'm not going to ask you what this guy is doing because I don't want any filthy answers, but you can guess what he's doing, look. So the guy there has uh, got his pants down. He's in a crouching position, so you can uh, uh, guess what he's doing, right? Eh, I'm not going to ask you to guess, it's too rude. Uh, he's going to the toilet, so he's, he's um, having a, you know, number two. And he is on the gallows, and he's, and he's pooing on the gallows itself. And he's going to the toilet there, and what that means is go... They say, I'm not going to say the word, but C-R-A-P. Uh, that was the expression to C-R-A-P on the gallows. And that uh, means not to be bothered by any threat of punishment. So somebody who wasn't bothered by any threat of punishment would have been going for a on the gallows. Now, this filthy humor, you get, you get everywhere in paintings of this period. You get it in Bosch as well. Lots of nudity, lots of sexual images as well. And uh, there are lots of bums in the picture, for example. And they were both influenced, both of the artists, I talk about this in my Bosch video, they were both in, in, uh, influenced by drolleries. So if we could pull up some images of drolleries, and uh, that's spelled D-R-O-L-L-E-R-I-S. And if you think about French, if anyone's French here, then, uh, you know, troll in French means uh, funny. Uh, we sometimes call them grotesques as well. And this is how you would have seen them. These were in the margins of illuminated manuscripts. If we go to the next one, it's kind of more obvious. I've put up two here. So if we go to the second one, there you go. So you've got these images all throughout. Quite often they were hybrids of animals. Quite often they were nuns looking at uh, sexual objects. And they were just a way for you would uh, a way for the artist to have a little bit of fun, really, and to poke fun at uh, religious jokes, uh, etc. And they were always in the margin of illuminated manuscripts. They were popular from roughly around 1250 right through to the 15th and 16th century. And both Bruegel and Bosch were very, very heavily influenced by them. Now, I mentioned early on about if we could go back to the painting. I mentioned early on about um, some images where there's more than one. Let's go back to some, um, the, the, the cat image is what I'm interested in at the moment. Uh, there's an image with a pet cat here. There you go. So in this tiny little image, which is the guy, you can see the guy there. See that image there, that image of the guy with the cat. Um, that has got three proverbs in one. That's why we say approximately 120, because we've lost the meaning of many, many of these proverbs. The first one, let's talk about the first one. If you go a little bit lower to what's, what, what he's tying around the cat, pull back a bit and go a bit lower. There you go. A uh, bit lower. You can see he's tying a bell to a cat. That is the expression. He's putting a bell on a cat. And that translates, if you pull back a little bit, if anyone here has had a cat and tried to do something to it that that cat doesn't want, then you'll know that those cats get pretty vicious. 
And so to do something like tie a bell on a cat is to, to, to carry out a dangerous plan. That one makes sense. Then look in his teeth. Let's have a look in the, the man's teeth. Oh, brilliant. So someone knows this already. Yep. So someone's already written up in the text, in the live text, that he's armed to the teeth and he's belling the cat. So he's armed to the teeth. He's got a knife in his mouth. And that's an expression in the UK that we still use to this day, being armed to the teeth or being heavily armed. Finally, he's actually wearing armor. And even wearing armor is a proverb. And it means to be very angry to put your armor on. So that means you've got three expressions just in the one. So who would have bought this painting? Who the kind of person who would have bought this painting would have been very wealthy people, Flemish collectors. And uh, they would have had this painting like I, like I talk about in my Bosch video. They would have this painting and they would have brought it out later on. Imagine someone comes to your house for dinner. You've had great conversations and everyone says, can we see the painting? They go to the other room where the painting is because there are sexual images are in there. So you don't want it in your normal everyday life. Um, and we've only skimmed the surface, but they could chat about this for hours. So it was a talking piece. It was, that's what it was. Most of his paintings were collected by a man called Cardinal Granvel, and he was a top minister for the House of Austria. Um, he might have bought this. We're not 100 percent sure he could have bought it. Um, there was also the rising middle class I mentioned about. They didn't exist before this period. And that's the merchant class who could now afford expensive paintings. So I think that's all I'm going to talk about for now. That's what I'm going to uh, cover for now. Just the very many. If anyone's got any questions, um, then please feel free to ask me. But thanks very much for attending. It's actually my very first live Zoom, so I'm a little nervous. Um, and do subscribe to Google Arts because I really use it a lot. It's fantastic for really zooming in on detail. I've been blown away by the quality of their videos as well. Um, if you have any further questions about uh, Bruegel, uh, feel free to ask me on my Great Art Explained channel on YouTube. Please subscribe to that if you haven't already. Um, or you can ask me on my Instagram as well. And um, what some, let me see what some of the questions are. Why are there so many people pooping? You know, really... Why are there so many people pooping? Why are there so many bums? Why are there so many rude things? To make people laugh. It's really, really simple. It's to make people be funny. And uh, yeah, we yeah. another question is, can we do more zoom-ins? We're going to do another zoom-in pretty shortly. And um, we will, uh, not shortly, but in the next few weeks. And uh, that's it, really. Sorry, I just, um, I think that's really enough for the proverbs. But you've got to really, really understand how someone from the Middle Ages would have viewed this. And it was really like us going to see a big film, going to see a Star Wars movie or something like that. It was so spectacular. It was so big, you know. And also, there's jokes in there, lots and lots of jokes. You want to laugh? Look at a Bruegel painting. So, um, and I'll be doing a Bruegel painting at some point on my channel. So thank you very much for coming and uh, cheerio.